Inshallah, the master is Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sit down. Can I have my bag back for a second? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second day of this wonderful conversation between His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and uh, quantum uh, physicists uh, from Taiwan, and, and the United States. Uh, we had a spectacular uh, set of talks yesterday. Uh, personally, I enjoyed it very much. I've enjoyed many of the questions that uh, His Holiness asked. And also in the afternoon, we had a very, very vibrant and interesting discussion. So for those of you who have the time and interest, we, uh, I invite you to come to this afternoon's discussion as well. So uh, let us get started with the second day of talks. And uh, today, uh, the first session, we're going to hear about uh, something uh, called superconductivity. I'm sure most of you have heard of this. And this is one... Superconductivity. This is a type of phenomenon that, in my personal view, uh, would be very, very difficult to imagine in a classical world. A classical by classical world, I would mean something without quantum mechanics that most of us uh, are much more familiar with. So without much ado, let's uh, uh, go to the, uh, the talks. The first speaker we have is Professor 
Tingguo Li. He's an academician uh, of uh, uh, Academia Seneca in tai Taiwan, and he will be giving the first talk. Oops. Okay, let me flip to the right page so I can give the title of the talk. Emergent Macroscopic Quantum Phenomenon of Superconductivity. Please, Professor Lee. Thank you. Uh, Your Holiness, oh. everyone, good morning. Uh, this is, uh, my name is Tingguo Li from Academia Seneca. And uh, it is my great honor uh, to be able to share with you some of the most amazing and beautiful phenomena in the quantum world. Um, as uh, Professor Chen has said, this is not your ordinary experience, but yet this is reality, as I will show you. So, as a... As a, as a scientist, of course, we have to be based on everything on evidence. So, the, my first part, is to show you the evidence for part is to show you the evidence for why the phenomena is so special, why so interesting. And then of course, as a physicist, we need to provide some understanding uh, to realize such a state is possible and uh, and you will see why it's so beautiful. And then of course we will discuss uh, okay, superconductivity, the name is, uh, needs a little bit, of the, the word needs a little bit more explanation. Super is, of course, means great. Uh, conductivity is super. What does that mean? Of course, uh, well, most of you probably have learned uh, super, uh, conductivity for a long time ago, but let me remind you in case uh, you forgot that uh, this uh, conductivity actually is a measure of how the material to carry an uh, electric current. It is uh, inverse proportion to the resistance. What it means, if the conductivity is high, the resistivity is very low, or the resistance is very low. Now the resistance, as you all probably imagine in your uh, middle school that the one has put in a battery and a wire connected to a metal and if your battery has potential drop, you see a current passing through, you take the voltage of your battery and divide by your current, you get a resistance. That everybody probably uh, know this, I'm just trying to remind you what this is. Lock. So this uh, Resistance represents how easy for an electron charge to move through a metal. And it, uh, it provides uh, heat if you have resistance. Now, this resistance, of course, uh, as some of you may know, that of course varies with temperature. And we, in the material side, we all know we have an insulator, semiconductor, and metal you heard all the time. Now, what is a semiconductor in this plot? I show you is uh, the vertical axis is resistance. The horizontal axis is temperature. It varies with temperature. It's the semiconductor is that uh, at a high temperature, it has a higher resistance, but then it goes down as temperature lower, the resistance becomes less and less, which it just means electron can be more easily go through the material. So it's getting easier and easier to go through. But suddenly, at a lower temperature, it becomes difficult again, much more difficult. 
And uh, compare this with the ordinary metal, which continually go down. The resistance keeps on reducing when temperature is lowered. And that's why this is called a semi, as you can see. You know, part of it looks like a metal, and the other part is not like a metal. That's all called a semiconductor instead of a conductor. Now, I have not shown you an insulator, because the insulator it actually has very high resistance uh, all the time. And uh, this behavior of metal, of course, uh, it goes down very quickly, the resistance. So the electron becomes easier, easier to go through the material. The, the the, the usual wire we use these days are made of copper. Copper at the 20 degree Celsius, or somewhere around here, at the room temperature, that's the room temperature of today here, it's a Low little bit less than that. So but then you go down, as temperature lower, it's keep on going down. It's go down by a factor 20, means divided by 20. So the conductivity increased by factor 20. As you go uh, to lower, lower temperature, maybe say 3 Kelvin, you get to a better, better conductor. So the, the you can carry same voltage, you can carry more current. It's easy. It's like uh, your water pipe in your house getting more easy to flow. Um, and uh, at a very low temperature, however, this resistance is not zero, which is small, maybe 20 times smaller than at, uh, right now at room temperature, but it is not zero, OK? And uh, so this is the usual material behavior we're all familiar with, um, but it's uh, related to resistivity. Now, the superconductivity was discovered in 1911 by an accident, usually in the physics <laughs> discovery. And uh, what it means by super, actually, it's a little bit tricky. What do you mean by super? Actually, it means resistance is zero. We just call this kind of phenomena superconductivity. Actually, the real meaning, exact meaning, is that the material has zero electric resistance. That's the definition, actually. And uh, yeah, this... So here, the, the electron that is being, electricity that is being charged through this... Yeah, uh, but no resistance. So it's, it's I mean, uh, conceptually, is it seen more like a kind of a wave going through, or is it conceptually? Now we'll come to it. It's yeah. more complicated than that. <laughs> and we'll come to back to oh, that point. Okay. And it will come to that. I will try to explain. But this is a, a gentleman got Nobel Prize in 1913, after two years, after he has uh, reached, but actually for the prize, not for discovery of superconductivity, because he tried to lower the temperature. Remember, the zero absolute temperature, zero Kelvin, that's called Kelvin, it's absolute temperature. And it's minus 273 Celsius. Right now, we are at uh, about 15 degrees Celsius. And then imagine you have to go down 280 degrees downward. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. <laughs> His Holiness was wondering whether they have put the AC on. Oh, yeah. Yes. So this, uh, and, uh, he, it is surprised that he found uh, that uh, there is uh, this, uh, this uh, resistance drops to almost zero. It's a uh, very. Yeah, he, he was just trying to go down to low temperature, cool and cool, and until he got about 1.8 Kelvin, that's uh, the record at that time, and then he got Nobel Prize for that cooling uh, to lower temperature, almost zero Kelvin, but not yet. And uh, then at the 4.2 Kelvin, they see this resistance of mercury, Mercury is a metal at the usual temperature, and the resistance suddenly dropped by four order magnitude, about 0.1 to 10 to the minus 5, and then dropping to 10 to the minus 8 very quickly. But uh, so this is a, a phenomenon he discovered. 
but he didn't get Nobel Prize for this, okay. <laughs> uh, but it's a very strange phenomenon because the resistance suddenly dropped by four order magnitude. Instead of just factor of 20, as I show you, copper from room temperature all the way down, just dropped by a, a factor of 20. But here it's a factor of four, five, six. And actually, it, the question is right away. And the, the message I hear is uh, that uh, there's a temperature called a critical transition temperature, T sub C. This means C just means critical. It means that at this temperature, the resistance dropped to very, very small value. The question is, is it really zero? Is zero or is it just small? So this is a big difference. Of course, that has a, had a huge debate. Many people trying to uh, repeat uh, this kind of work. So but of totally course, now we know, totally and this is called a superconductor. Totally, just uh, for clarity, so it's not a discovery of a new medium. It's he's just managed to bring the temperature down for the mm. same medium. Yes. So it's a very, uh, uh, so that uh, uh, discovery, of course, uh, generates many people interested in low temperature physics. So low temperature become very important. So you want to see this kind of phenomena. And uh, this is uh, showing now we have many superconductors. I've just picked a few because this has a function of time. The time is in the horizontal axis and the critical transition temperature here. Uh, when the mercury is about uh, 4.2 Kelvin, started from here, and then you have lead, niobium, and all the way. Until 1970, 80 something, we only get uh, about uh, 23 Kelvin, absolute temperature 23 Kelvin for the highest transition temperature. And then at uh, 1986, these two gentlemen uh, found this new material that gives about a 40 degree Kelvin, 40 Kelvin for superconducting transition there. Of course, then there is a sudden jump to a very high temperature. This is our next speaker, well, uh, Professor Wu and Professor Chu, that made uh, the important discovery of this new material, YBCO, and that jumped by 50 Kelvin. So now it's to 90 Kelvin. It's above the liquid nitrogen temperature. That's the nitrogen usually is in gas phase. If you want it to be in liquid phase, you have to go to down to 77 Kelvin absolute temperature, very low temperature. But it's not difficult uh, technologically. And so then you uh, have a man. Right now, the highest temperature we can find of material is 136 Kelvin. It's about 140 degrees below zero Celsius. And uh, now, of course, people are still trying to find room temperature. Can we have a superconductor at right now at this temperature without cooling? And then we also find some other material. That I won't go yeah, into the detail. The resistance is very much and the resistance is very much in the same way. In the same the same the so, the question then, if there's no resistance, we first we just review very quickly, why do we have resistance? When your electron moving through the material, why do we have resistance? You know, there's uh, several reasons, but simplest reason is that we have the impurity, disorder, defect, and no crystal is perfect. There's always some other things that uh, doesn't belong. And uh, so you're causing charge moving, bump into that, go uh, backward, and then cannot go through easily. So you put reasons. That's very easy to understand. The second one is uh, more interesting is that actually the atom does not sit there. The atom are always vibrating. That's how we put in sound here. I'm talking, you can hear it, it's a sound wave, the air molecule is vibrating. Same in the material. If you hit on a, a metal bar, you will hear the vibration sound. That's the sound wave. And that's the atoms are vibrating. And of course, making the electron moving a little bit more difficult. They will bump into the electron, uh, the atoms, and they uh, hit each other, and they cause resistance. And the, but as temperature goes down, this kind of behavior becomes less and less important, and that's why this metal 
keep on increase their conductivity, resistance getting less and less important at a lower temperature because the atom don't move very much. But unfortunately, atom will always be moving because that's uncertainty principle. Atom cannot be stationary. There's no particle can have absolute stationary unless it has infinite energy. So this uh, is uncertainty principle. Okay, but that's not important. Uh, electron scattering, scattering, scattering. Yes. Yes. With impurities. With uh, higher yeah, yeah. So even at the zero yeah, temperature, this low loss of chromosomes. So, but then, the, so, so, what is exactly is the nature of the electron that is going through? Ha ha ha! Ha ha! Very good first question. Firstly, you should explain the what is the el electricity? Yeah, yeah. And whether it is just Waves. energy. Charge. Energy also, you see, I think there must be some particle. Particles, yeah. Without particle, electricity is movement. I think difficult to say. Yes. Even light, some particles. particles yes. Yeah. But they are also wave. <laughs> 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 depends. Depends. It's a two sides of a coin. Depends on which way you want to look at. Many things are two sides of a coin, right? Depends on which angle you look at. Uh, but they have both, okay? Uh, we'll come to that. Because I didn't just generate some of it. Not doing it. Not it. Generator of electricity. Body. Could them and them and them one day? No, and them and them you are your own. So, for example, imagine just take the example of generator, you know, yes. which produces electricity. Yes. So, can you know? Does it make sense to say that that dynamo is somewhere? Right. Dynamo. Dynamo. Depending on the type of material used, you yes. generate different types of electricity, or is it just same. you know? No, the same. same electricity is just different current amount of uh, how much passing through per unit time. Uh, you know, this uh, amount of uh, it's same. Same. There's no difference. Okay. All the metal transport. Similar. Lightning or the Lord. So, for example, lightning is yeah, an electric a charge. charge yeah. yes. But they also have ion charge. Here, we only talk about electron moving. Ion is fixed. Mm -hmm. There's no ion motion. Okay? In the light, and they also could have ion charging, ion motion. So that's uh, two different. Ion, of course, can also move. But here, yeah. in the material, like this material, ion doesn't move. move yeah. but the, uh, all the atoms sitting there, mm -hmm. it's the electron that are moving more easily. Of course, unless our, our, our physical also you see, there's some electricity. Yes. Oh. Yeah, that's why the they can the use the e no, no, <laughs> EKG the heart to pumping. You had to a lot of what? So yes. the heart yeah. pumping is also yeah there's yeah an yeah. That's why you can process. they can check your heart. <laughs> so from where it produced that electricity? So where is the electricity ah, being ah, produced in a body? That beyond me. <laughs> 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 We'll talk about that later, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it will produce uh, many things. Moving will produce electricity. <laughs> uh, we come to that. Uh, good question. Uh, okay, so, but of course, uh, electrons also have the same charge, so they would have a cool room with partially everybody learn uh, in your. Uh, school that uh, the same charge will repel each other. So they also hinder the motion of electrons. So then when the electrons move in this material, there's many things to make it move difficult. And uh, so the qu first question is, can the resistance be zero, not 10 to the minus 9 ohm? Just because you know, maybe he has a lousy equipment, very rudimentary, 
he cannot measure very accurately. So he got uh, to this looks very small number, but small number is different from zero, as you all know. Zero is a magic number. Uh, doesn't come very often, and it needs a special uh, feeling about that. And uh, so this uh, number could be very small, so many people challenge him. One thing we could... Uh, <laughs> Not relevant, yeah. Although it may nothing do nothing on its own, but when you accumulate them and then combine it with the other numbers, it has a huge function. Yes. No, no, what I mean is that the, uh, in the, in the real world, we use real numbers. Real numbers, you can have a many decimal. I can have a 0 0.0.01. Point, 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 oh, it's not 0. It's still 0.0.01. Point, point, oh, oh, okay? <laughs> but uh, I could only have a point zero, 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 zero. No matter how many digits, it's 0. That's different, very different, okay? Real number is uh, different from discrete number. You talk about discrete numbers, so we'll come to that. That's quantum again, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 then we'll come to this. <laughs> now, well, how do we know it's zero or not? So you can imagine, I show you, there's a, you take uh, this uh, material, you put it in a battery, you measure the current. Now, if there's no resistance, like what I show here at the bottom, if the resistance equals zero, you have a battery, then you have current. So what you, can you do? If you take away the battery, once the current begins to flow, you say, let me take away the battery. What happened? In ordinary metal, you can go home, try it. Before your eyes can even blink, your current already gone. But here, you take away the battery, the current can go on for years years, we're not talking about days, and it has been proved by experiment. experiment. Yes, yeah, this is a proof by experiment. <laughs> and the extrapolation, of course, after two years, they are so bored to looking at it, they don't want to do this experiment so anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So totally, let me make it, uh, you know, yes. let me understand this. So the, what you are saying is that in a conventional case, when you take the battery out, electricity goes away. Yeah, yeah. But here, because of the zero yeah. you know, uh, Re resistance. Point, resistance, so even when you take the battery that is, conserved, that yes. is you know, con containing the energy yes. taken away, yes. energy is still... Yes, the current is still flowing still forever. Flowing. In principle, it's forever. Of yeah. course, nothing is forever. So I say essentially mm -hmm. forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's connected. It's a loop. So yeah, they a make loop. this material, they just uh, add uh, and start the current and take away the battery, and then the current just go on, go on. Go it's on. a loop. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, so it would uh, go on. The experiment lasts about two years, I think, if I remember correct, and then they just stop it. Okay. Uh, because they cannot measure the appreciable difference. So the extrapolation is, it will go on forever. And the law uh, survey should the law you learn the law yeah, man, and the law the John and Mazo did this, because experiment change well, this, of course, against all the intuition, ordinary experience we have. But uh, here I'm just saying that, uh, so this is uh, experiment uh, evidence. So the superconductivity in practical is zero resistance, not approximately zero. Not because he doesn't have a good equipment, instrument to measure it. So it is a quantum effect. And that right away clarify this is not your ordinary classical word. We talk about not a real number continuous. There's a jump. It's zero. Uh, we have to be so then you know discrete word of one zero two minus one very well defined. But once we come to real number point oh oh one oh 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 one, uh, okay, there's many decimal. Uh, so what exactly zero is a bit tricky. Here it is very clear. There's nothing, no absence of resistance. 
So this is also has to be a macroscopic, not microscope, not like hydrogen atom. It's just one very small thing. Here, this is a big material, a loop of uh, superconductor currents going. We can see it's a macroscopic. All the electrons, about 10 to the 22 electrons per centimeter cube, are doing this. No bumping each into each other, no resistance. Impurity, they cannot see impurity, defects, they just go through. Superconductivity, the conductor to So, Professor, so in terms of, so Professor, in terms of the size, just to help us, you know, the, 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 the uh, non physicist here. I will show you the next, uh, the, the, the one, the size is centimeter or, um, uh, or even now they have wires uh, even kilometer long. So, uh, Size is not an issue. Sure, okay. uh, it's just ordinary material we see. It. You don't have to be nano material, don't have to be micro. So this is uh, showing th there's another interesting property of this material. Besides zero resistance, it's called a Meissner effect. It's a very strange property interacting with the magnetic field. So you put a magnet. This one is a magnet. This is a superconductor. Uh, this is just draw some drawing. This is for the anniversary, uh, 100 years anniversary from a magazine. That you see this, uh, your this magnet levitate. There's no touching. So it's against gravity. It moves upward. Once it becomes superconducting, you below the temperature, the magnet lifts up. It's called a levitation, magnetic levitation. So that's another strange behavior. Somehow, the magnetic response of the material is different from usual metal. So the medium material, is it a, a kind of a, a human construct, some kind of fabrication? A special no, 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 just a magnet, ordinary magnet. No, 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 the, 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 the conductor. Oh, the condu superconductor is one of those uh, high temperature superconductors we just showed. Well, what uh, he, in his lab, we show this uh, every, uh, very often to our open house, everybody can come to see levitation. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 No, no, this is a super, you just cool it. Just uh, make it go to lower temperature. This is actually the ni liquid nitrogen that cool it. And then this uh, a magnet, original setting here, and then just, I, I, I couldn't, I didn't show the film. Actually, there is a movie, but I mean, the, the, because of time. The magnet setting there, then you cool the temperature down and the magnet will, <laughs> will <laughs> Yes, that will come down. Yes, that will, I will come down. Yes, I will come down to that. Yes, yes, yes. I will explain that. Oh. Yeah, this is, I'm just uh, describing the phenomena. No theory, no model, nothing, okay? Just what you can observe. Mm -hmm. Nothing more than that, okay? And uh, then one realized there are two kinds of superconductors. They under magnetic field behave very different. Imagine looking at uh, this line. This is temperature. This is field. But look at uh, this line. You go from very high temperature. You come down to here. Suddenly, you below this critical temperature. You see no resistance in this part. Now you are applying a f magnetic field to this material. The interesting thing is the first part you see is that when you apply the magnetic field, the field is being repelled outside the material. See this shape? That's the superconductor, the field bended. 
that was observed by this gentleman called Meissner. So this is called the Meissner effect. And this state called Meissner. So when you apply a field, the field being repaired. Then if you apply higher and higher field, you could just go to the normal state. That's called a type one superconductor. Or the other kind of superconductor is the you even more interesting is you have a mixed state. The field can penetrate, but not randomly. Penetrate in a very special way. And uh, I will come back to that. This also involves another Nobel Prize. Okay, this is uh, another interesting state. But in all these states, resistance is zero. So the state changes. You first, uh, you don't let the magnetic field get into the material. But it's too strong. They cannot hold it off. You can move in, but you move in a very special way. Oh, okay. Uh, the chairman is uh, warning me. So, you know, the you show the draw your way. So, so given the effect that we are seeing here, where it, it's a seems to be a function of primarily over cooling yes. the temperature. You have to be yeah. in that state, sure. lower than so the question is Otherwise, asking, you sure. are in a normal sure. state, nothing. So the question is Olenis so. is asking is that at some point, the, 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 magnet, the magnet sort of bounce off yes. and levitate, yes. So which seems to suggest some of it's, it's kind of you know, bypassing the gravity force. Yes, so because there's another force okay, to so counterbalance so the gravity. question is this. So if that then means I will come down to. gravity is somehow related to the temperature, does that mean in the Earth no, some no, no, parts are hotter, no, 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 some that. parts are cooler, so does that have a no, different no. gravitational pull? Okay, no, no, not the gravity is not related. It's this material, the properties relate to temperature. Gravity. Yeah, but the, the, the reason why the originally it was holding is because of the gravity, isn't there? Yes, yeah. but there's no force to push it back. But once you're below this temperature in the superconducting state, there's a force to push it I will show you right away. I will show you right away. Yes, that's what I will show, the next one. Okay? So I will, we will discuss this, why it's come out, okay? We will discuss, you will see. It's a very logic reason, very simple reason one can understand. Of course, you have to buy a certain <laughs> scenario. But uh, the first scenario you have to buy is this uh, three gentlemen propose a theory to describe what happens, why this very strange phenomenon occur. Now, they are proposal is very interesting. They say that uh, we probably have a pair of electrons. Electrons, instead of moving along, like usual normal metal, they actually pair them together. How do they pair? They actually have a, a charge, mass, and spin. So the two electrons, the same mass, same charge, but they could have a different spin. One is a spin up, one spin down. And this spin up and spin down form a pair. Okay. And usually, this have an equal number of upspin and downspin in the metal. And unless you apply magnetic field, then we'll talk why the magnetic field call has strange behavior. It's related to this. So now we have, a, instead of each individual electron, imagine you have a many pairs. So if we have a 100 electrons here, there are 50 pairs. They form pairs. OK, this is called a Cooper pair. And that's of, uh, a general professor's name, Cooper. And uh, he said that we should have a pair to explain this. And uh, then, let me go then quickly. But the electron all carry the same charge. It's supposed to repel each other. How can they form a pair? Where is the attractive attraction come from? They should hate each other, but somehow they don't. <coughs> what happens? And uh, the explanation, this particular paper, very amazing paper that show that if you think about it, we have iron in the material, which is positive charge, electron is negative charge. So when the iron moves, the one electron sees, ah, this iron good, they are opposite charge. So he comes and then he vibrates, there's another electron sees positive charge and comes. 
and they look like these two electrons love to be near each other. So they become effectively attractive. Okay, even though they were supposed to repel. But if there's another media to provide a glue attraction, then they become possible. So repulsive become attractive. Sorry, uh, this is and so that is the uh, you know, the 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 schematic show that's two balls actually now become a pair. Two electrons, of course. Uh, this uh, vibration mode is uh, soundable. So that works, of course. This theory has been checked billions of times, so uh, many predictions. Now let's imagine how we understand that. This is the important part. Now how do we understand all this phenomena? Think about a very huge ballroom. You have uh, playing walls. People are dancing. Many, many pairs are dancing in this beautiful ballroom, following the rhythm. And nobody bump into each other. And there are tables, there are columns, but they just go around. And they exchange partner. You remember, you see the movie, old movie, they're dancing very beautifully, exchange partner, moving around. Every, nobody is sitting there. Everybody is moving, dancing, but nobody bumping into each other. Just imagine this uh, lady is a spin down electron. Gentleman is being up electron. Think about that, and then now you think I have a hole, put the 10 to the 22 electrons here, and they are all doing this. What a beautiful thing. <laughs> you couldn't think of anything much beautiful, amazing than this. And they are all dancing because they all dancing in the same rhythm, coherence. There's no bumping. No hitting, even there's a column like a defect or impurity, there's table, they just bend, bend. And this is the beauty of this state. Electrons somehow or collectively move in a coherent way. Okay, that's a special kind of quantum. They exchange partner, we have a, they can even exchange partner. If they don't exchange partner, this is called a Another kind of quantum state fluid. It's called both Einstein condensate. Both is uh, gentleman from India, uh, great physicist. So this is what you want to imagine. Now you imagine you have uh, this music playing, huge number of pairs are moving, and they don't bump into each other, and they exchange partner, of course, because here you have a face. Imagine the gentleman has a mask. All the gentlemen, same height, same dress. All the lady with the mask, same height, same dress. You cannot tell who is your pair. You change pair, you hold around. And that's exactly what happens Does in this system. Coherence for the, for the microscopic, microscopic quantum state. state. Yes. Yeah. Now, when the, uh, the, the quantum neck of Jorwa, then the rabbi neck of the shadow is. An electron to get a chicky chill cube, a sorachi, and a susu that's a chair. The soon teaches a chorba, that's a and some one yamru, Tony, Yambo, then the come with the whole chimpuginalia dancing and Yamambuji, but a chilly dance shabu tabuna, and a chicky chill cube. Okay, that would be fair. Okay, okay. So, uh, anyway, so let me go quickly. Yeah. In a coherent individual mode. So you may still have sometimes one, one person slip and they get a bump, but that's very small. One out of a 10 to the 20, we don't really care. Now, we, let me explain the magnetic field. It's very strange behavior, this Meissner effect. But if, when you apply field to this, what hey, is exactly happened to electron is they have a different number of spins. Uh, for up spins and down spins. That is the number. Now you imagine in this hallway, there's more gentlemen than ladies. Then what happened? How do you dance? But each one still want to dance with the lady a pair. So there's always some of them left alone. And they don't like it. Superconducting states don't like it, hate this. And uh, when they hate it, what happened? They are smart. They just push it the field outside the Outside the wall, hall, hallway. So the fear is outside, then you have an equal number here, 
then they are all happy. What the Dalai Lama said, be happier. So they want to be happier. Uh -huh. So they get very happier to push the fear outside. That's my thing. The fear, look at, oh, the fear. The fear is pushed outside. Look at the drawing. Now, let me just show you. This is what happened. It's a re in reality, it's what happened is when the magnet here, in usual matter, we all know, it produces shielding current. And this shielding current has the right magnitude that pushes the field. So you see the field is bent. The magnetic field line from north to south, it's bended. And this bending lift up against gravity. So you have a force, move it upward. Uh, otherwise, it will not. So this is uh, the current. So it's a shielding current actually occur in this state and then all the fear outside, and everybody is happy inside. No problem, okay? So they, they know how to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but if you apply stronger fear, how do they make them happy? They cannot repair, it's too much to repair them. Then what they do? They're even smarter. They say, okay, me, I cannot repair you. What I do is I, I confine you. I make all the fear occur in a small region, but separate them periodically, like a column. So now I have all this column essentially made of this magnetic flux line. This is called the flux, or quantum flux, made it into a periodic array. This is array, this is called a vortex lattice. Abrikosov has a name because he got Nobel Prize 2003 for this work. Uh, and uh, so they are even smarter. Now I cannot all repair you. So you can join us, but you have to be in certain very nice positions. Then we can still be resistance zero. Okay? The, so now you see, they, they like to be happier. They are smart. But if you go too much fear, then you can see all these uh, flux, uh, quantum flux would begin to touch each other. Then there's no way. Superconducting become normal. Okay, so one can explain this, uh, this, this line. You go up from here, you first repair, then you confine, then you become normal. That's when they say, Marabe Gavliani, magnetic field by Chirutanje. Quenega Quenal, the electron, Damarabe, and Shadan and Zulian, the field by Chirutanje. Yana and field such a day, Yan Nunjo Suje. So the dancing continues, okay? And uh, then we now, just two more, like, there we there, okay? Another unforeseen consequence of pairing in this coherent state is the loss of charge identity. What do I mean by that? You remember two electrons supposed to have the same charge. According to Coulomb law, they should always repair each other. No, they do not. So it means effectively, they don't see each other at same charge. Okay? This is an unforeseen consequence. When they wrote the paper, they didn't realize. Then they realized this is related to uh, Dr. Lee's yesterday's talk. This is a, uh, so I won't be bothered. But effectively, is the identity of original electron has lost. In our jargon, we say they change to a different quantum state, have different quantum number. But in, in simple interpretation is the electron don't remember it's an electron anymore. So now comes the discussion. When superconducting is, um, so essentially I laid the f uh, groundwork for this superconducting. The next two talks probably are all related to superconducting, so you will learn a lot more, but here I'm just showing a very simple picture. Just imagine the ballroom dancing, okay? And uh, they all behave coherently. Defense and interoperability no longer matters. Uh, do we have uh, an analog phenomena in real world? Hmm. Interaction between electrons play a dominant role in the emergence of new physical property. It's because of interaction. So now interaction is very interesting, very important. So we talk about isolated electron, we understand everything about it, but when we put 10 to the 22 electron together, completely different. They behave very differently, 
they forgot what they were. Interaction so we were asked to produce some questions on that one. <laughs> but in any case, what I, the picture is very simple. This electron paired and they move around, dancing around. They no longer like remember they are the same electron in the normal state at a high temperature. They are different. They have a different charge. Spin, actually, I didn't talk about. Also different. They they are entangled like yesterday. Each pair is exactly the entanglement pair discussed by two professor Chess <laughs> yesterday. And so exactly that entanglement pair. Each one is entangled. So actually, w each one is entangled with every other one. All the spin up, all the spin down. That's an interesting. But anyway, this is a, a, a theory, a model that we use to explain millions and millions of experiment results related to superconductivity. And it works surprisingly well, works very well. And, uh, but uh, we still keep on finding new interesting phenomena. So because this is not our common reality, but this is real, okay? Because everything I talk about is being proved by experiment and theory, okay? And, uh, but still, the, the emerging of a new macroscopic phenomena, and the, in that state, the electron has lost its original identity. identity. Thank you. Your, your holiness, please. Comments and comments. <laughs> <laughs> Kanda, so one uh, thing that is uh, sort of a major contrast, a point of contrast between the way in which, you know, the physicists, um, you know, presenting reality here versus the way in which a classical tradition like the Buddhist philosophy would look at reality is the way the the the, the the <laughs> So for example, like the in, in the classical tradition like Buddhism, when we, you know, engage in exploration of reality, um, the, the approach is to first come up with I the big not picture. not necessarily Buddhism, ancient Indian, I, Indian tradition. Indian tradition, yeah. So, um, so for example, so yesterday we talked about uh, the conditioned things which are, you know, constantly changing, impermanent things. So you look at the world and say, okay, there are two broadly different types of phenomena. One is things that are subject to change. They are momentary, yeah, yeah, impermanent. Yeah. But then there are things which are not that momentary. They are unconditioned. And within the conditioned world, then you have um, matter, which, are, which has some obstructive properties, which has mass, which has you know, extensions, special extensions, and so on. Then you also have uh, another fundamental category, which is what in Buddhism or in the, in the classical Indian tradition would refer to as consciousness or the world of mind, which is the primary characteristic is that of subjectivity. It's a subjective experience. 
then you also have part of your taxonomy of the world, a reality, certain things which are neither mental nor physical. So for example, like the attributes of impermanence or time or the concept of person. So those are part of your description of reality, but they're not objects in the world, nor are they subjects of experience. So you make a broad category. So, so then if you look at the quantum description uh, or the physics description, it seems to be really staying at this first category, which is really about the matter. Space is a particle So the one question his holiness would like to ask you is you know, yesterday we were talking about space space time uh, symmetry. So in the in that context when you use the word space, is it conceived as a kind of a, a, a base composed of particle? Deep, that's what uh, depends on what landscape you're talking about. This is important. In physics, we always separate different energy scale, different land. You talk about very small land scale, you talk about uh, very high energy, you, know, you talk about, like material here, we talk about the energy scale is small, electron volts uh, below that. So it's a different, uh, we have a different kind of uh, tools and different uh, principles apply because they behave differently. Yeah. The, the one, this uh, particular idea that uh, we have a macroscopic uh, quantum condensate of all these pairs actually was used in Dr. Lee's discussion yesterday. So it's used in the cosmology, yes. space time. Okay, this principle. So what we learn is that maybe learning one material, you say, math, so interesting, it's a material. But the fact is, when we learn from one material, what we learn, the knowledge, actually can be applied to many. Actually, this also in, happen in neutron star. Okay? <laughs> so this is uh, the, the kind of idea seems to be very restricted, but actually it has a profound effect because it brings in many new thinking, and that could be applied to different parts of the... Sure. If his uh, holiness has one last short comment we can do otherwise yeah, we, we need to move on yeah i think okay. we can move on yeah all right thank you Quant thank you can you sign it for me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which one is this a universal in a single atom <laughs> Our next speaker is Professor Malcolm Wu. Uh, he's also an academician of uh, Academia Seneca uh, in Taiwan. And he will be giving us, uh, telling us about superconductivity, a novel quantum state. Your Holiness, Professor Lee, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's really my great pleasure and honor today to uh, speak to you uh, in a subject that you have to learn from Professor Lee, a lot of detail about the fundamental physics. So what I'm going to do here is that, as you can see from the first chart, I have a two nice picture which show the structure of the material we are working on. So what I'm going to talk about is, well, very briefly, just remind you what superconductivity are, and then, yesterday we have a very vibrant discussion. Uh, His Holiness also talked about, as a scientist, we should be doing something good for the humanity. We should not do something distract, right? And so I'm going to just show you a little bit about what superconductor can really do for human society. Okay, so it's a 
application that has been already in uh, going on. And then I talk about some of the recent discoveries on superconducting material. But my focus will be the last part, to talk about what this interesting phenomena, but what kind of material, what do we learn now? Of course, it's an open question. We still are not sure what's going on exactly, but there is some hint. Okay, so I'm going to show you what we know today. Let me just uh, remind you quickly the zero resistance, as uh, Professor Lee mentioned, and the so-called Meissner effect, which has the perfect uh, magnetism, are the two pillars of superconductivity. And that leads to this interesting phenomenon. It's not a jet levitation, you can suspend it. The magnet here, the, the picture show here, this is the magnet. This is the superconductor that cooling at below this uh, transition temperature. It's not only just levitate, but it can suspend it down to go. In fact, that exactly can be explained by Professor Lee's the last bell graph. You have a different view. The view penetrates and forms into the vortex core. And then essentially, then you have attraction and repulsion together. So you can show this kind of behavior. So this is a real interesting. Uh, so this, I don't know why it didn't go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, go back. OK, so this is the true novel quantum state that can be seen macroscopically. You can sit on the table while it's going. If I have a chance to bring the liquid nitrogen here, then we can show it today. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> so this is a macroscopic phenomenon. Okay. And let's see what it can do to human society. Uh, as we mentioned, the zero resistance, so we can make it into wire that can carry current, uh, transmit the power without any energy loss, okay? So that is already going, and uh, there is a proposal, well, maybe one day we'll see this kind of super grid thing using superconductor to connect all the electricity that save a lot of power, especially <laughs> if we uh, have uh, power from solar, from a wind, and we need a better transmission to do that, okay? And this is our dream. Hopefully, you can see that in the near future. And we can have a high-speed, real high-speed train. And this is the true model uh, in Japan, uh, has been running for several years. It's a 20-kilometer long track. It's a levitation train. And this train can run up to 550 kilometer per hour. That's the test right now. But the, in principle, if you put in vacuum tube, then you can go up to 1,600 kilometer per hour. Okay, it's the energy saving and so on. So that's another dream. We hope it comes true. And there are many medical applications already uh, going on. And this is a special device called using this a very sensitive uh, superconducting material. We go there's a phenomenon called a quantum interference effect. It's a related to the quantum phase uh, idea. And we can use this kind of a superconducting quantum interference picture to make in a device, which it has a very sensitive uh, detection to a small signal. Uh, Johannes, you are talking about the heart may be beating, you give some electricity. So we are using electrical graph, it's easy to match that. Now, we can use this squid because the small signal, you can give you a dipole, a small magnetic signal. So you can use that to detect the hobby. And the beauty of that is not only to see you, if especially for a um, pregnant woman, you can see both the infant, uh, the baby, and the mother without intrusion, okay? So that's the very beautiful uh, uh, application for that. And we can look at that, it's already been going on so for years, in the brain science. 
저거 같이 보통 한번 보지. 근데 제도 그래서. 그래서 okay. basically it just becomes much more sensitive to the yeah, okay. very, s- very smaller very signals. Yeah. Right. Very small signal can give up. So like a brain wave, this is the for brain signal, okay, and has been using. And of course everybody know about this MRI, okay. This is essentially using this uh, superconducting magnet. Uh, Professor Lee talked about if you have a current at a loop, and without even charging, it's continuing flowing, the mag- magnetic field will be in there. So when you cool down and set up, it'll be there for, okay, very, and we can use that for very important energy research. The, the, the so-called uh, Gaff particle, the Higgs particle was discovered in this machine, and mainly because that they have such a high magnetic field uh, generated, which is such a high energy. This is a picture that uh, from Academia Seneca that we have collaborated and built a very large array of a telescope. I think Professor Lee really make a major contribution to get the money to do this. Okay. <laughs> and it's just important for understanding the universe. And the key component is using superconductor to detect the signal. And we can also use the device to uh, evaluate like an uh, aircraft. The, is there any crack? or any material has a failure without any, you know, not destructive uh, evaluation. So there are many, many applications is going on here, okay? So uh, I think the superconductor become more and more important because of certainly this got potential application for human society. However, there's a question we critically have to ask. Well, as uh, Professor Lee mentioned, you need to cool the material down to a certain temperature in order to see the property and the function. So we need to find a material that whether we can have a, a round room temperature or even higher, so we don't need this complicated Shanghai system. We don't need to use complex cosmology. Um, uh, energy uh, conservation me agoche to the ko gulam ki chakche the thamu shi so gura ta chitde so mo go to ne tapshe yo re besta the kang interest so we need to so this is important part what we are working on try to find different kind of new material and this is the reality you know this is interesting phenomenon but what's the real world we are working on and professor lee mentioned that things that discovered from 1911 up to 1986, over three quarters century, the increase of the superconducting temperature is very slow. Okay, so but fortunately, two scientists from Switzerland found this particular material. Very, I uh, come back to that. Okay, and that shows superconducting property not that high, but it indicates there's a potential that you have uh, something new, a uh, different, because this material. If you look at it, uh, without this bearing here, if I don't have the bearing add-on, it's insulated. It's a very poor conductor, not conducting at all. Only I replace a little bit of uh, lanthanum by the bearing atom, it suddenly becomes metallic and then eventually superconductor. Okay, so we have a new paradigm to look at. And uh, very luckily, uh, I was in the U.S. at that time in Alabama, and uh, my <laughs> student and I in the lab, well, in 87, I find that another set of material, which is showing here with this structure. And the interesting thing is this material has three times higher transition temperature. Okay. Okay, and then later on, okay, this is the search now going almost 30 years. We're trying to still trying to looking for this uh, room temperature. Uh, we call this the holy grail of our uh, com- uh, superconductivity. Now, then we have, as a scientist, then we have to understand why this material compare with the previous one, this left side here and the right hand side here. Why the T temp- transition temperature can have a three times different? 
if you look at the basic units, it's the same. Here you have a copper oxygen as a prime. And with that, uh, this is oxide, oxygen. And with some lanthanum, well, this is kind of cubic, distorted. But in this, if you look at on one simple way to look at it, it looks like that I'm cutting this uh, um, A phase system, octahedra, right? And then cut into half. Then I have a, a two pyramid, and somehow in between, let's insert another element. But in the meantime, in this part, I take some oxygen out. And I have a two dimensional become a just one dimensional chain from the structure point of view. Eh? Then the superconducting property is different. However, of course, we know the superconducting all still coming from this region, this plan here. Okay. Here I want to remind you here, in this system is the bearing replace a little bit of the lanthanum atom. Okay, original is the two lanthanum, one copper, four oxygen, four meter one unit. And when I replace a little barium, then it becomes metal and superconducting. And in this part is one yttrium, two barium, three copper, with seven minus x. And this x is important. If I have a 0.5, like a 6.5 oxygen, this material is insulated. It's not super, not conducting at all. Because what is this group study? Okay. So the material really rich, really beautiful. So I start making slightly the chemical change. Here I change into the bearing, and here I add l a little bit more oxygen, and that goes. Back. So the material base for all this copper oxide material to become superconducting is to introduce <laughs> electric <laughs> carrier. <laughs> yeah, to introduce electrical carrier to the original insulating material by changing chemical stoichiometry either by substituting element in with this uh, so-called 214 system or changing oxygen concentration in 1, 2, 3. But a theorist like a Professor Lee, then he would say, yeah, this is your material world. But as a physicist, what is this? That's what his picture will tell you. He said, in this original insulating material, okay, as I mentioned, there's a copper oxygen plan, copper oxygen form. And every copper has one electron, you know, because the D electron, and you count it, it has one extra electron. And every electron has a spin. So it occupies one side. And because you have an electron-electron cooling interaction, and this electron here, if I want to bring another electron in, it costs a lot of energy. You know, it's like a uh, your hand is sitting here, you're squeezing too much energy, right? So this seat can have it one person. So I cannot move. So, so, uh, so in this case, yeah, in this case, I have to quietly sitting here, I cannot move. All the electrons have to be sitting here, cannot move. So there is no conducting. Electron cannot move around. You cannot carry. So in 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 Buddhist um, you know analysis of matter, also categories are made of different types of matter. Yes, you know I things see. that are tangible and has special extension, things that are not tangible, but still part of the matter. Mm. So there are different kind of you know, material objects are identified, yeah. I see, okay. So what, what we do chemically, this is chemists, chemists are doing,
by changing the stoichiometry. What it's doing is that it to replace that chemistry. However, the physics to see it, it the effect is that uh, one electron is being taken out. If one extra one bearing go into the lanthanum side, then one electron is taken out. Or one oxygen put it in, add onto this original empty oxygen place, then one electron is taken out. So I'm moving out one electron. And the beauty of this is, if I have an empty space, then stuff can move because this thing can move here. Or this one can move. So this room. Electron So this is the basic picture now. Most people agree for this material to have. Why? It becomes metal. Okay. So this come with a very interesting for the past thirty years. A lot of work and has this uh, interesting so-called phase diagram. And here we are showing this is the number of dopamine, or the number of electron essentially, or the hole here we talk about uh, the positive charge. And here's the temperature, okay? So you're coming from a very original uh, insulating, has uh, some magnetic features, state, and gradually become metal, and then down to this region is what we call a superconducting region. And there are many rich phenomena. Well, you ask Professor Lee, he said, I don't understand at all yet. We don't understand. So this is the current work. We're trying to really understand the full spectrum. However, however, this all comes from this very simple copper and oxygen feature. Very simple structure here. So this is how theory, experimentalists are working very hard to understand today, even today. And luckily, well, here is the question, you know, why there are so many competing orders in this simple copper oxygen based high TC material. Okay? But very fortunately, nature is very kind to us. So in 2008, we found this interesting new material. Has similar feature is the iron, also the D transition metal, like uh, copper, uh, with the selenium. Certainly, certainly the same column as oxygen, right? But it's the one layer here, and you s continue stacking on, this material becomes superconductor. So it's very simple structure, okay? And it can have a relative high TC also. Up to there, we found uh, 10 years now, then we know it can have a close to 70 K transition temperature. And you can even make it into just single layer <laughs> to make it superconducting. This is uh, very, very uh, intriguing. You know. and, and so we have created a platform to better understand the origin that because the simple structure is always should be able to learn more. And it's interesting that it can have a very important application also. Okay. So the last 10 years, we spent a lot of effort, and many people work on that. So there is uh, some understanding concerning uh, from high temperature down to low temperature when it becomes superconducting. And the similarly, there is that, uh, such a phase diagram predicted, you know, or we propose essentially, that similar to the, you, know, you will remember I just showed you for the copper base. And so the superconductivity in this ion selenide is similar to the high TC copper oxide, which is a result from a strong electron electron correlation. Okay. And that, as, as I show here, there are many competing order, competing state again to get to this result. And now the question is what is this? Do we understand, especially from a more realistic point of view, as an experimental, I like to see what kind of material, what possible to lead this? Okay. 
So we have done some more detailed work. Okay, this is a beautiful uh, single crystal, uh, very fine wire, and uh, we examine that by electron microscope. Okay, and then to look at the structure, the diffraction, and also the composition of this material for the ion selenide. And we identify this quite interesting, the ratio between selenium and iron is five to four, which means that iron, four iron with five selenium. But if you look at the original picture I show you, it should be one to one. Ideally, it should be one to one, but why this is five to four? And that gives you this uh, very, I don't know why suddenly it goes this. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, it gives you a very interesting, beautiful uh, superstructure, you know, from the X ray and uh, the electron diffraction. So we were able to use um, some very simple analysis to try to pin down why the diffraction is, in addition, those uh, bright spots. There are some beautiful this, uh, small spot, what is this? Okay, and the analysis tell us, if I look at the plane of the ion sitting on, right? So every four ion, then there's one missing. It, it goes periodically, okay? This is only one cell, but like you can see it's periodically. So this kind of an ion, Beckon become a very older state in this particular four to five composition, which means we have a two different ion sites. One is occupied, we call it sitting eye, another site called a 4D site, which is empty. And this material is insulated, just like the yttrium one, two, three with 6.5 oxygen. It's not superconducting, it's not conducting at all. Well, I, mean, I should not say it's just poor conductor. Okay? But this thing, if I add a little bit, just a little bit of an extra iron, okay, gradually, and what happened is, you know, this is two material. The up one is the one not super, not super conducting, that is just insulated. But that bottom one picture is the superconductor. And here I show you is the X-ray picture showing that where there is some uh, distraction peak going on. Okay, I would just wanted to point out here the t key feature. For a non-superconducting one, look at here. Okay, and we are probing this from room temperature keep going up to a very high temperature. Suddenly, this peak shrink, right? Changing from this two position to that. Okay. So this, this is the insulated material. However, when it becomes superconducting, you see that the X-ray position doesn't move at all. Okay. This is the experimental data. I, this is the. Oh, I think for you, I think I should. People know how we experimentalists are doing work. With this work, then we can do an analysis and to see what the occupation of the atom. And then the conclusion is, this, you know, make it simple. The original empty 4D site was start to occupy. Start to occupy by the iron atom. Okay, in this lower panel here, and we find out when you occupy and you make it more random, which means that I can use different way, okay? My higher temperature and more iron, more randomly, the material become better superconductor. Okay, so the, the, the based on this, the structural study, we can conclude that this two side, you know, 16i and 40, which is empty, uh, um, when, is older is the insulator, okay? But when I have an extra iron atom or high temperature heat treated become random, then 
the four D sites still start to be occupied. And this occupation leads to electron, just like uh, what I said earlier, taking out of the certain atom and give you the carrier. And here, we introduce that. So original empty, now you start to feel, then you start to see the carrier. Okay, and superconductivity emerge from that. This is just like, you know, so we are seeing this. We have two states in the system. One without, or is the empty, one with atom. Okay, just two states. At a certain point, you can just look like this, you have a domain world. I think in, uh, in cosmology, using this picture to show this, uh, how universe form also, the cable mechanism. And we know if we can do much finer, when we have a very fine mixing, like this one, a lot of it mixing together the material, and I have a very good superconductor. Okay? So, so the key here, from our understanding today, especially from our own research study, okay, the material origin of this high TC, uh, I can conclude this. Both copper-based and iron-based high temperature superconductor, some form of defect. Either the oxygen non stoichiometry in oxide, or just the iron vacancy in the iron-based material. And they both display similar phase diagrams showing that several very interesting physics state feeding to each other. And there seem to exist at least two different electronic states that are necessary when you are properly doping. If the superconductor was a metallic, and there is a magnetic and non-magnetic. And in, we know Chinese, we are always talk about this yin and yang, the coexistence. Is this the case? Probably more fundamental is that, as I say here, is it empty, then start to fill. Or here, it's fill, then it take back into empty. This is two analogies, but in that up, up here is the real state, real material. And here is the electronic, you know. But that give you, uh, remind you, you know, we have learned from Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu, yes. <laughs> right? Lao Tzu, uh, chapter 11, he said, Worry. 30 spoke meet at a hub because the whole we may use the wheel. Clay is molded into a vessel because of the hollow we may use the cup. You know, if we don't have this empty space, we cannot use that to hold anything. And the wall are built around a hub because of the empty space we may use the house. Like this room, without this empty, we cannot be sitting here, listen to your harness, the stock, right? So the conclusion is that two come from what exists, but used from what does not. So that's the nature, right? It seems to play this uh, beautiful uh, consequence. So my question is, is a random occupation to the older NP space the most fundamental cause to novel effect in nature? Yes, <laughs> It's a random occupation in the order empty space. Yeah. So as we see from the material part, we need it empty and then start to put in and then you see something beautiful coming out. Thank you very much. That's all my time. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I think the question also, you know, is this similar to what the middle way you are talking about now? What? 
the middle way, you are middle way yeah. in, you know, it's just similar to that concept. Lord,我要去，比如，就特别在乎这些，认识些，没特别在乎认识些，可，那么些，查账的钱包嘞，哎，你怎么能抢完呢？在你啊，他，在他，怎么能，查账全部有没？十个个在里啊，钱有那么
in the exciting talks, and we'll Thank continue you. Con conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank we're you. running a little late, so uh, let's meet back in 10 minutes. Uh, well.
，对，但是他开始中国的。Started. Let's uh, start with the continuation of this discussion, Professor Lee. Uh, I want to make some comment and try to connect two lectures together into one picture. Uh, <laughs> Professor Lee did mention superconductivity, just like a 
pair of electrons like a dancer dancing in the room. But Professor Malcolm Wu talked about is he seems to be building the dancing hall <laughs> with our atoms molecule. And what I'm going to say is, let's imagine the dancing hall is three-dimensional. So with a pair of electrons dancing in three dimensions. If Professor Wu were to build a dancing hall by copper and oxygen, all the electrons would be tied up. So when the dancing hall was built, there's no electron, there's no dancer. So it's not conductive, there's no dancer. And so, what you really need to do is to build a dancing hall with a, diff a little different structure. Like not if you're talking about like F-E-S-E, -E, you have different mixture in such a way when you build the three-dimensional dancing hall, there are some electrons left to pair up to become a dancer. So, like doping some barium in the lanthanum or FVS structure change a little bit. This is really building the dancing hall with some electrons left to be a pair of dancers then dancing around. So these two things are really uh, combined together in the one picture. Thank you. 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 Thank all right, I'm, I'm from uh, Duke University. So I'm going to share with you uh, some uh, work that I've done many years ago, and it's in quantum transport. So by transport, uh, we mean pretty much what professors uh, Lee and Wu were talking about. We're going to put a potential difference between two points and try to measure the current carrying properties of that system. So it's quantum transport because you can only understand the behavior using quantum mechanics. So uh, what I want to focus on are a few points and hopefully uh, this will, uh, m much of the audience ha has had a chance to hear about uh, question, uh, issues about uh, quantum uh, coherence and, and so forth. And hopefully, I will reinforce that and tie everything together so that people can leave with a better sense of what all these terms mean and all these concepts mean. So uh, I would present, uh, well, now it's just going to be one experiment because I have more. It would have taken much too much uh, time. So one experiment which exists with some key feature, uh, features of quantum systems. And these features are difficult to come to grasp with uh, in the co in classical context. So again, by classical, I mean what we're more uh, familiar uh, in our everyday life. So uh, for this particular experiment, we're going to focus on quantum interference uh, and also the Aronoff-Bohm effect. So uh, this is a, a very special effect in which you can see physical... <laughs> This is a very special effect that only occurs in, a quantum, in quantum mechanics where you can see the effect of a magnetic field even though your electrons do not move in the region of the magnetic field. Okay, so I want to start in more familiar territory, classical waves. So. We're all uh, familiar with, uh, if you have a rope, you yank it a few times, you can see a wave moving down. So that's a classical mechanical wave. Uh, another classical wave would be electromagnetic radiation that Professor Lin, for instance, talked about, the light sh shining down on us. 
And when there are many, many photons, it's more classical. So we're talking about that limit. So uh, I apologize, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, math, but I, I try to put as much uh, physical intuition into it as possible. When you do a wave, it will oscillate up and down periodically. And that's often sinusoidal in its dependence. In addition to that, if you, hmm? uh, you will see a drawing uh, in a moment, and, and it will make more sense. So there are certain quantities that characterize a wave. One is how big the wave is. Mm -hmm. If you look at a wave in a the pond, uh, there's an amplitude. There's also something called a wavelength. What's the distance between two peaks? There's something called the period, or which is the inverse of the frequency, how often in time before it repeats itself. So that's uh, shown here. So if you take a wave, sinusoidal wave, let's see, uh, all right, where is the mouse? Oh, there it is, okay. If you take an instant in time, let's call it time equal to zero, and look at it along the, the string that you've shake, uh, shaken, you'll see it'll go up and down and up and down. The height gives you the amplitude. The distance between crests give you the wavelength. And if you did it differently, oh, okay. I, if you do it on, on time axis, instead of having distance here, you just look at one point and look at the thing go up and down. And time also looks like this. Now, the interesting thing is that if you have two sources, as shown here, if they generate the same type of sine waves, but starting at two different points, and they have this form, then they would be considered to be phase coherent. They will follow the same time dependence. But then when you put them together, you will see places where the amplitude is big and places where amplitude is small. So that's called interference. So the point is that if you add two waves together, you have a choice. This whole object here is called the phase. And there's this extra thing here that controls how shifted the two waves are. If the two waves are aligned together, when you add them, you get double. And if they're shifted by 180 degrees, they interfere destructively and you get nothing. That's something very unusual about waves. You get nothing. <laughs> ลับตูสตูกินะลับนี้บ่ติจิกชูกิจตูตานติตูตานจิกบ่ดรอยนะเอาคุณรบัญญัติโบเจอันนี้ญัญโบจารเวนะลับติเชิดตูกอรวะแ
Mara Jujem, the Ranjuton, she de Gorak, and the Lapchejun Yombat. So you're talking about natural phenomena. In, in the natural phenomena, there are waves of different forces. The, in fact, uh, if you do this uh, on the surface of a pond, have two sources that are in sync, in phase with each other, you would see regions where uh, it's destructive, where they cancel each other, other regions where they add. You don't gain or lose any energy. It's just that depending on the, the phase difference, so to speak, you can either have construct or anything. Okay. So this doesn't happen with, with particles. With two particles, you can't cancel them. Well, we're not going into high energy physics so where you have particle and equal. So, okay. So the, the, the really famous experiment started out using light. Okay. So it's the Young's double slit experiment. So there you take a light beam. Uh, it may work for short distance with this, but usually it's done with laser because with laser, the phase is definite. You don't have randomization, the phase. You shine it through two little openings so only light can go through uh, the two points. Now you look at a screen far away, and you will see that the difference in the distance of the two paths, there's a difference in the distance it has to travel. When they travel different distances, the phase difference will be different. Then if you look along the screen, you will see places where the, the interference is constructive, so that they end. Other places will be dark, or they destroy each other. So this is a wave phenomenon. And in fact, even with these waves, you, you see the separation on the right between the interference patterns. If you make the spacing between the, uh, the slits smaller, make the spacing smaller, the interference actually separate out. And that is a form of the uncertainty principle. So in wave mechanics, you have uncertainty principle built into it. Now, the interest... Yeah, yeah, no, um, then uncertainty. The, 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 uh, Heisenberg, the quantum number, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says you are uh, the DT casual in the court is long. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, what Planck and people like the Broglie, the proper decision that a particle has a dual uh, existence as a wave. You can do the same thing with the electrons. When you do it with the electrons, because the electrons are point-like, if, if you can do it so that you get one electron per second, you don't build up this interference pattern of, of dark, bright, dark, bright, immediately. You get these random spots. But when you get many, many of them, you see this bright, dark, bright, bright, dark pattern. So this shows that electrons can behave wave-like. Even, even when they ascend one at a time? That's really hard to imagine. It interferes with a self. That's, that's something that we all struggle with. The <laughs> So am I right in saying that if the wave life wave like features demonstrated when huge amount of electrons are accumulated because we see this kind of bar like pattern there. Right. But the, as you already uh, mentioned, even you're sending them one at a, time, one at a time, but somehow 
and, and knows how to interfere. If you try to find out which hole it goes through, try to find that out. You don't get, you don't get the interference anymore. That's, that's magical. Uh, okay, so a little bit more math. Uh, don't, don't be uh, scared of it. I just want to motivate. So uh, during the discussion, uh, <laughs> That's uh, that's not going to be 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 scary at all. Uh, uh, the 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 thing <laughs> that uh, I want to uh, uh, point out. So so here's h bar, which is the Planck constant divided by two pi. So we know this is quantum mechanics, uh, famous Schrodinger equation. There's an i here. What is i? i is an imaginary number. That's the square root of negative one. We usually don't know how to take the square root of a negative number, so we have to imagine something. Let's call it imaginary. I didn't invent it, but that's appropriate name. So this makes it very, very different. This also is a kind of wavy equation. So using this, you can describe quantum mechanically a particle with mass. Uh, in the non-relativistic uh, limit, this is what things look like. And the upshot of it is that there's something called a wave function. So this is like the sign that I had written before for classical wave. But there's a key difference in addition to the introduction of the imaginary. That is, the interpretation of psi is so-called a probability amplitude. It's not the probability, it's the probability amplitude. So you probability the amplitude, the probability, the generation. So in the case of classical wave, the amplitude you can see, you can measure. Here, the probability is what you can mm -hmm. measure. You cannot measure the amplitude. The amplitude itself. So, okay. Uh, now we also heard about linear superposition. This is a concept that means that if you have two function psi that satisfied the equation I just shown, which we're not going to worry about, then if you make any linear combination, so add up some number, which can be not just real or imaginary, can be complex number, complex number times the first wave function plus another complex number times the second wave function, that's also going to work. That's linear superposition. It only involves the first power of psi. That's why it's linear. This is extremely important for physical uh, processes. That it's a linear relationship. One last thing, because this is probability, when you square so-called psi and add up all the probability everywhere, you have to get one. You can't get anything less or more than one if you add it up everywhere. So because these are waves, and the consequence of all this is that you can have interference even for particles, not just. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so another equation, but no worries. So uh, one way of formulating quantum mechanics is called Feynman path integral. And all you need to, to worry about is that it can be written in this complex form. That's exponential, the imaginary constant, times something called the action. Now, this thing may look scary, but it's 
actually made up of the sines and cosines. And if you take, uh, and, and the reason I want to motivate this is that now if you look at the different paths and use your superposition principle, then you would have one action along one path, another action along another path. You have these two exponentials, then you add them up together. That gives you the new wave function. But to measure something, you have to find the probability of that wave function, and you have to square it. Did David Bohm's help with that? Yeah, David Bohm did. Yeah. Okay, so. That's a photo of David Bohm on there. That is, yeah. yes. And my, uh, I understand you have had many conversations with him. Oh, yes. I yeah. consider him my teacher <laughs> about quantum physics. <laughs> he explained about quantum physics to a person. Hopeless. <laughs> Partly because when, when when I listen, it seems I understand something. After that lesson, nothing. <laughs> David Bohm and Von Wesecker, the German professor. These two. Very kind to me. <laughs> so uh, these two uh, great physicists were the ones who recognized that if you put a mag field in between these two paths, but not where the electron may go, because the electron has char a charge, it will have a way of sensing this mag field. In fact, it will introduce a difference. So the way I've drawn the two paths have the same length, but by putting a magnetic field, you can change the effective path length. And it's written quantum mechanically in this form, but in the end, actually more relevant is that this path difference is going to be the magnetic field times the area of the magnetic field. So that if you multiply the strength of the magnetic field there times that area, that will give you a measure of the difference in phase. Therefore, now, by tuning the magnetic field, you can tune it from constructive interference to destructive Stop. interference. You can make it 180 degrees out of phase or 360, which is the same as zero, because uh, these functions are... are now uh, before i go on i want to comment on the question of coherence that we talked about and the question of why or s some understanding, we don't know whether it's f fully subtle, understanding why microscopically we need to describe things quantum mechanically, whereas we seem to live in the classical world. So this has something to do with so-called coherence. Now what I did not mention about these two paths is that in addition to the phase difference depending on path I mentioned, there's also a time dependence. And if the time dependence is not maintained, if there's exchange of energy, that time dependence would, would oscillate and jitter. And when you do that, the two interference will jitter. So you will average between sometimes destructive and sometimes constructive. And when you do a measurement on a long enough time scale, it would average out. So the interference would be washed out in that case. So then you don't see quantum mechanical effect. So that's Kaza. the idea of, of the decoherence. Then the quantum mechanical sometimes
So uh, as far as I know, uh, and, and though my colleagues may, may uh, correct me or feel otherwise, uh, the only macroscopic phase coherence system we know are superconductors. Others are, are uh, we are not uh, quantum mechanical because when you have many particles, it's very easy to lose coherence. And this is one of the themes that Michael Berry ha has uh, talked about repeatedly. Okay, so hopefully uh, I've gotten people a better grounding in terms of interference and wave functions and coherence and so forth and, and superposition. So I want to show some experimental realizations of these things. Uh, this is data from IBM, Richard Webb was the lead author, a colleague of mine. If you make a tiny ring, uh, I don't quite remember what this dimension is, it's probably about uh, a micron across uh, or thereabouts. A micron is one one hundredth the thickness of your hair. If you take your hair and cut it into a hundred parts. And then he put a magnetic field perpendicular to the view graph. So now you have a magnetic field in this whole region. And then you measure the resistance as you pass current between the top and bottom and change the magnetic field. Now you see you're tuning the interference phase and you're getting the quantum interference. So this is a solid state realization of the ahronal bohm effect. Now you can also do it in semiconductors. Uh, my f colleague uh, Greg Temp and myself were the first to do in a semiconductor. And uh, this is also kind of interesting. Quantum mechanically, we live in a three-dimensional world. And classically, we cannot really get to two-dimension or one-dimension because we would think that to be in two-dimension, one of the dimensions has to be shrunk to zero. And it's very hard to make something that shrinks to zero. But quantum mechanically, you can do it because when you shrink a dimension, the quantum energies become very, very far separated. And if you get so high in energy, you cannot you don't have an energy to access it, then you're locked into the lowest state in that direction. And that's how you get to two dimensions. Could three dimensions say the gare? Then I'm four dimensions you look in it. And then there is a then the um granted that you may yam yon to the chain, you call it three dimensional world now your one. Granted you may yam yon to the choice you could in your. But the dimension. But the, 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 but the, you know, for example, even when you shrink. The three dimensions are quite kind of so can you explain a little bit more clearly the, the, the three dimension and the two dimensions that you're bringing up here? Sure. Uh, so uh, imagine, let's just take a, a, a picture past that, that. Thank you. So. To us, this is a very thin thing. Uh, even though it's thin, it's still three-dimensional. Uh, 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 it, it has a finite thickness, right? That's not zero. The thickness is not zero. That's still three-dimensional. But quantum mechanically, when you're thin, uh, the wave function, so uh, Planck is the one who says that the, the energy allowed uh, states are discrete greed in their energy. So uh, it's not like you have any energy. And, and when you make it very thin, these energies become very, very far separated. So, I mean, even the notion of thinness is a relative. Pardon me? Even the notion of thinness is a relative. Uh, concept, isn't it? Uh, uh, thinness, thinness, thinness. Thinness, yeah. thinness. Yes, yes. So that's a, a relative concept. So you, it, you have to be in relation to something. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Mm. 
Right. So, so for instance, uh, this is actually something that Professor Lee has much more expertise. Uh, when people talk about extra dimensions in, in field theory, why we don't see the other direction, why, well, dimensions, why we only see three dimensions, it's because the extra dimensions are so small that in order to get to the higher uh, energy states to see the dynamics, was, you have to be at the Planck scale, which is 10 to the 16th giga electron volts, which is very, very high energy, and we cannot access it. That's why we only see three dimensions instead of 10 or whatever. But we don't really know, but that's one of the postulates. It would have been easier to explain if I hadn't gotten rid of all the other view graphs because uh, there was one in there, but we, we can discuss more uh, uh, later. Okay. So, so now we have this uh, semiconductor system. The Kingo ready to get the two dimensions. Kingo ready or ready Kingo, the two dimensions, the three dimensions like the Lulantre. Then was. Okay, I'm running long. <laughs> okay, in this semiconductor, there's a two-dimensional electron in this layer. So I, I can't draw a three-dimensional uh, system, but this is when you're uh, looking, if you look this way, you're looking down at this. So parallel to the top interface, there's a two-dimensional sheet. And if you pattern it, uh, you, you get a ring here. Uh, and then you can do your Aaron Bohm effect, and those are some of the data that we, we had uh, way back in. Oh, the left is Richard Webb's, and the right uh, was our, our data in 1987. Okay, so I want to change gears now. I'm going to make use of all these concepts that we talked about to, to see a different phenomenon. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about chaos a little bit. Chaos is something which is deterministic. It's not random. What do I mean by chaos? It means that I have a rule that tell me, tells me where, if I know the particle at this point, at this time, and its speed, I can predict its position at the ne next time. So it's deterministic. But if you take a particle and put it in a confinement that looks like a stadium, so what do I mean by stadium? So these are stadiums. It looks like a football stadium. Then it turns out that if you have a particle, it, even though you may say to yourself, okay, there are uh, trajectories. If you bounce perpendicular back and forth uh, at some points, it should just keep doing that back and forth. But it's very unstable. If you're just a little bit off, it gets into a mess, something like this. The thing would just bounce all over the place. So if you're a little bit off and you're very far away, that's a sign of chaos. So uh, a very well-known example is called the butterfly effect, where if you look at weather, the, the supposition is that a, a butterfly in Brazil, flapping its wind, uh, wings could cause Texas to have a hurricane. Okay. So now, now we have a, a problem. The, the supposition of chaos is that you're extremely sensitive to initial condition. If your initial condition is just slightly different, you can be far, far away. Quantum mechanics, on the other hand, tells us there's the uncertainty principle. I cannot define something very precisely, so how can I tell if two things are really slightly far apart? But no matter. Even though you can't really define it, you can see consequences. 
So what we're going to do is look at the difference between two different cavities. One is the stadium cavity, which is chaotic. We're going to open two little holes on two ends so we can pass current and measure the resistance through it. We're going to differentiate that from the circle cavity, which is not chaotic. So this circle cavity has symmetry, so it has, good, uh, has quantum numbers and has stable uh, orbits. So they have very different behaviors. And you can see, if I measure the resistance by changing the magnetic field that I pass through the plane, this shape looks very different from that shape. And these shape differences are related to the aeronaut bohm effect. Okay, so here, unlike the rings, I don't have a well-defined path, but I have many different paths corresponding to the classical trajectories. And each trajectory will enclose its own area. So if we go back and look at the phase difference between two paths to be uh, proportional, to be equal to the magnetic field times the area, these different paths will have different phase differences. And you, you add them up, you will see the difference in shape. And if you want to be more quantitative, it has to do with the distribution of areas. In a stadium, because it's chaotic, it has a single well-defined escape time. So the distribution of unclosed areas is exponential. In the circle, there's no single time scale the distribution is power law. And now we go back one more step. The relationship between area and magnetic field is sort of like the uncertainty principle. They're related by the something called the Fourier transform. If you Fourier transform an exponential, you get a Lorentzian. And if you Fourier transform certain power law behavior, you get this very sharp triangle. So now we have an example where putting all these concept, concepts together, we can differentiate between two types of system, one that is chaotic and one that is uh, non-chaotic. And the sad thing for me, or maybe not so sad, is that I've been told that this data is in a textbook. Although, uh, unfortunately, they, they didn't refer to me. <laughs> so recently I gave a talk and... Uh, uh, people in the audience, uh, my colleagues, oh, I've seen that. Uh, these are people from Germany. Oh, I've seen that in the textbook. I, I didn't know that uh, that's your data. But anyway, <laughs> it's all a uh, good cause for, for, for science. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I will conclude by uh, asking uh, His Holiness a question. So we just saw that in quantum mechanics, we can have effect even though we are not going through the region where there's a magnetic field. So something which is not in the region where the electrons are can have an effect. What are your thoughts? Are, also, are there examples of something similar in, in the Buddhist teaching and philosophy? Hmm. Kazu kishu wa kare wa da. Kazu yi wa kare. Ni ga yi be mo sunga te ba. Wari mo mo re. Dai ki wa ge mo do. Kada da. Uh, I think the ancient Indian tradition, mm. you know, the all destructive emotion such as anger, jealousy, these very much related with ignorance. Ignorance here means we are totally sort of relying the Appearances. Appearance, la. So since you see the Kazu Takada Nangsu Kariyo Koranga, the Tambal Zin, 
so this relates to some conversation that we had yesterday which in the in, yeah in the indian tradition the classical indian tradition the idea of two truths two levels of reality is brought up because a large part of the problems that has to do with our emotions strong emotions really comes from a kind of a, a, a naive realism which believes in the the world of appearance the world of appearances so um, however you know what we perceive does not completely correspond to what is actually the case so therefore a distinction is drawn between two levels of reality one is the conventional everyday perception the other one is the deeper uh, underlying ultimate truth so it's an unexamined perspective on the world is the conventional truth. Therefore, according to Indian tradition, is the investigation of the reality. They we call the understanding about reality that we call wisdom, jnana. Hmm? That is the counterforce to those illusions of our way. Hmm? Like that. So now, uh, the, what is the reality? Now that, then, there are many different schools of thought. So the, the quantum physics clearly shows there's big differences, appearances, and reality. Daniel had a chisu jingo bully at the quantum physics, Tato Shadua. Now Tato Dumetabati, she was Pingdua. So, one thing that's for sure is that the more you expose yourself to the quantum description of the world, uh, it makes it very clear that there is a huge gap between our everyday perception of the world, naive perception of the world, and actual world. Of physical reality. Chazan Kazan engaged in other quantum physics, chick petigis, the same thing in Yabot Topping and Dilla, Chadang Lord, Artegans, but the Shuk Chuan. So, so therefore, yesterday we talked about this Chinese quantum physicist making the point that in some quantum physicists who genuinely live with this kind of view of the world, real physical world, maybe there is less tendency to grasp at black and white. In strong terms, in you know, objective reality. So that, and the third one is very important. The third one is that you have to see. Nangzum, nangzum, team, what symbol? The third one is very important. Because you have to see. So go look at the number of 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 the so one thing that Nagajuna pointed out very early is that, however, you know, even though we have this conception of reality, but if you subject, you know, anything to critical analysis, trying to find exactly what it is that we are pointing our finger at, then nothing could be found. Nothing can withstand that kind of analysis. So he says that, uh, for example, with relation to matter, you know, in the Buddhist classical theory, matter is you know, composed of, you know, four elements. So there without the elements. Jumudunisucheni,Jumadi,Juche,Jungdus,Namjungazo,Sutasa,Zidati,Jungdurche,Zada,Tiji,Jungogora,Tadusan,Yamabi,Tadusan,Yamabi,Tadusan,Yamab
So uh, in this, uh, you know, the you know Nagarjuna is commenting within the context of classical Indian theory of matter, where uh, there is an understanding that uh, ultimate constitutive elements are really those elements, and the the macroscopic world of matter that we experience are derivatives, basically composed from this ultimate constituents. So when you subject even the elements themselves to critical ana analysis, nothing is to be found. So if the constitutive elements themselves are not to be found, then how can you find that which is constituted from that? But then he goes on to say that, but that doesn't mean to say that the, the material world does not exist. You know, we just had a cup of tea, we had nice, you know, uh, cakes and stuff, and we also, also experience satiation, you know, the sense of satisfaction having enjoyed them. And also when we, if we were to, you know, bump into this table, we're going to knock it. So there is an experience, there is a world. But so in this way, you know, the notion of two truths is brought up so that while you acknowledge that at a, in the ultimate sense, we may never be able to, you know, describe what it is in an, in, in an, you know, we may never find anything that can withstand that kind of analysis, but that awareness does not undermine your appreciation of the robustness of the lived world that, that, is, that is there. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, and, and also the one advantage of that is that this is really helps the way in which we relate to the world because we, if we are aware that the solidity and the concreteness that we perceive is our own perception, not the reality, then it will have a tendency to undermine strong reactivity and strong responses to them, so which then also help our relation to the world. So His Holiness was saying that this looks like a really good middle way, and therefore Nagarjuna has said in his fundamental treatise on the middle way that um, uh, that which is dependently originated, so because he's Really now, in the end, you can talk about the world and reality only in terms of relations, only in terms of dependence. So then he goes on to say that that which is dependently originated, it's essentially empty. And, uh, and this, you know, is a world that is dependently designated because when you use identity, you have to give them designations. And this, therefore, is the middle way. So you don't reject, you don't go into nihilism, nor you go into, you know, absolutism. Quantum physics, Janzota, Topic, Part Sen, Eugene, Contingent, Sen, Indusaneta, Nibo Chai Induta, then a Tawa said, Kyanzo Tishabota. So, since you know what quantum insights from quantum physics is suggesting is that the objective world that we tend to believe in the classical sense really don't stand up. You know, it, there is, you know, there, you cannot find it. Uh, so then, but at the same time, you do need to talk about the world. You do need to have a description of the world. Mm -hmm. So maybe quantum physics can borrow more of the Buddhist language of this dependence, mm -hmm. this relational kind of, you know, approach. So then in the quantum physics, the kage yomars, the yiji che ding di, keng ju jinan sha che, cha ye mo ho che, kala ye mo ho che sha sha na. It's <laughs> almost saying that uh, there are sometimes you do meet some quantum physicists who even question the notion of reality because of their you know insights that they have gained. So he was he was saying that you know you know he thought that what how, how about putting such people in a room without any food and without any T and C if they can feel the effect of reality. <laughs> Jazaka, Luruki. 
So the Nagarjuna's view is very powerful uh, because in Buddhist, you know, history of Buddhist thinking, there have been different types of approaches, including a particular strand of thinking, the, the, the mind-only school, that went to the extreme of actually rejecting the reality of external world. Mm-hmm. And so Nagarjuna found the middle way where he accepts on the conventional level the external world just as our in- internal world of experience. So Nagarjuna's approach really seemed to be very powerful and insightful. And when it comes to positively characterizing the reality description, he uses the language of dependent origination, the language of emphasizes the language of relationships. Mm. <laughs> Sem so, um, so His Holiness's point is that actually this is not just a speculative philosophy. It has real application for a Buddhist practitioner to really internalize that way of perceiving the world. Buddhist practitioner and Buddhist as well as general, particularly the student of Nalanda tradition and the follower of Nagarjuna's Losupusa's yeah. philosophy. Philosophy. So he was giving the example in his own personal life on a daily basis, he uses a beautiful experiential song of the seven Dalai Lama, which really encapsulates in a poetic way how to internalize this insight into emptiness on a daily basis. We need to move, move on. So mm-hmm. we'll hold the discussion mm-hmm. uh, after the next talk. Thank you so much. Okay. So, uh, let's move on to uh, the next talk, Professor uh, Mo Zongyuan uh, from Taiwan University. Uh, he's also a, a member. Uh, 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 thank you. Yeah, he's also an academician. Uh, he will be giving us a talk about something familiar and also unfamiliar: water. <laughs> <laughs> Suppose I'm giving yeah. him yeah. empty glass. <laughs> okay, uh, your holiness and uh, fellow follower, friends. Uh, it's my great honor to be able to speak here on a subject uh, very familiar to you, as water. And just when I start to talk, the heaven sent down a lot of water. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> heaven agrees with me. And I also want to promise you that uh, my talk will be much, much more easier to understand. <laughs> There's no quantum physics. <laughs> I'm not a physics, I'm a chemist. <laughs> so uh, the subject of water uh, can be talked in many, many different ways. Uh, it is also an important um, element in Buddhism, uh, one of the four uh, fundamental elements, uh, water, fire, wind, and earth. So, uh, there are other people also very concerned with water. There's so much water shortage, water resource shortage in the world, uh, like in Africa, in a desert place, also in India. We, many people are concerned. What I'm trying to do is to give a scientific view of water and then 
relate to the two great concerns. We have one, the point of view of Buddhism, how you look at the water and how it can be uh, uh, integrated with the scientific view of water. And the other is uh, uh, the natural water resource problem, which Prof Professor Lee tomorrow may touch in a great scale. Okay, first, water is uh, very important to us. Uh, it's life supporting. Our body is 60% uh, of water. Uh, a newborn baby actually have it about 70% water. But water is very peculiar. It's very, it's unusual liquid in the sense that it's probably is different from most of all other liquid we know. So it's, it's special, but I would not call it miraculous. Uh, it sounds more uh, like uh, uh, something uh, uh, religious, but the water is just very unusual. I will show you uh, how it's unusual it is. Well, if you look at the abundance of chemical elements in the universe, we have um, something like one. 109 uh, chemical elements. You start with hydrogen. That's number one element. Number two is helium. Okay, it's, it's mo the, they are the most abundant uh, elements in the universe. Helium. Uh, helium. Uh, helium. Uh, helium. And number three is oxygen, okay, in the universe. But helium does not have any chemical reaction. So if you consider the most abundant uh, chemical reaction resulting in uh, molecules, you can, uh, uh, you, you would believe that should be between hydrogen and the oxygen, which give you water. Hmm? So you probably can agree with me that the uh, Water molecule is the most abundant molecule in the universe. Actually, people, scientists, astronomers, has been able to detect water far, far, far away in the distance of 11.1 uh, billion light years away mm -hmm. from us. And uh, that's the signal uh, which people uh, decide is uh, coming from water molecule. And it's far away in the galaxy, and so that uh, you can believe that it's all over full in the universe. On Earth. The galaxy is the she world. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the uh, property of water. In school, and in daily life, you know what water is. It's shapeless, it's formless, it's tasteless, it's orderless, it's colorless. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, a negative term. So, should you tell us uh, But uh, But the water molecules themselves are material, though, matter. Yes, yes, okay. yes, okay. yes. Okay. But the, the water you the hold in the glass. It looks like nothing to you. I mean, it has no shape, no form, no taste, uh, no odor. Uh, of course, a, a scientist uh, look at water in a lot of diff all kinds of property uh, uh, that's influenced by temperature. Uh, since 19th century, chemists has developed a robust framework to describe all liquids. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, ethanol, methanol, uh, or, or all kinds of liquid, uh, and predict what they they are like. But the water seems to break all the rules, break all the rules. It's peculiar. It's the most abundant liquid, but uh, surprisingly, it's uh, scientifically it's difficult to understand. It breaks rules. <laughs> So would you say, I mean, ice is water or no? Ice is solid water. Solid water. Right? Solid water. Solid water. Solid water. Uh -huh. 
Okay. So this only is getting to the point. It's it's not formless. <laughs> and the uh, vapor is gas water. Casa. I guess it's and the vapor, the gas water. <laughs> <too>. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, in the air, we have lots of gas water. Yeah. How water is uh, peculiar? How uh, we call anomalous? Uh, its behavior different from uh, the normal liquid. Um, most of the liquid, when you press it, you press it hard, it, it, it would, would, would not like to flow because it got squeezed and do, does not flow. But water is in contradictory. When you press the water, it's easier to flow. The water actually becomes more easy to flow. Second, most of the material, when you heat it, it expands. When you cool it, it shrink. Shrink is normal. But in water, in certain temperature range, water, when you cool it, it expands. So that's very uh, unusual. And the solid water, as uh, your holiness just mentioned, uh, that's ice. It's lighter than liquid. That's also in contradiction to all the other uh, uh, liquid. When most liquid, when you cool, solidify, if when you freeze it, 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 it sink to the bottom. But uh, for water, it flows. That's the ice. It flows on top of water. And the water has a density maximum. Density maximum. And also, I would say, density minimum, which we discovered. Uh, most liquid, when you change the temperature, its density just continues. It, no maximum, no minimum. Just change it a little bit. But water uh, behaves very drastically. And uh, for such low molecule weight, water is very light, very light compared to other uh, uh, material. Uh, it's very light, but uh, water uh, is a liquid. Otherwise, in other uh, stem molecule, Time, it should be a gas. It should have been a gas, but somehow it becomes uh, liquid. And the number six, water has very high surface tension, very high surface tension, just like the picture show this insect, uh, uh, insect, and uh, uh, it can stand on top of water. On other liquid, the insect would. <laughs> Just fall inside, it cannot stand. Uh, this phenomenon is due to uh, high surface tension. <laughs> Mm. So you, you're saying that if it's a n not water but other types of liquid, this bug would just sink? It would sink. Would sink. Yeah, but water is different. Uh, the solid water... But what about tea? Tea is water, yeah? Tea is essentially water. Yeah. When you freeze uh, it, uh, the, uh, the rock... The, the ice is on, 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 on. So the, 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 the flies can float on it, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we 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 kill by the temperature. <laughs> it's too hot. It's too hot. Okay. <laughs> this is our study. So this was saying, you know, it's it's a competition whether the heat of the tea is going to kill it or you're trying to reach get it out is going to kill it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is our data. Uh, in in, in uh, about four years ago, uh, we were able somehow to keep water from freezing down to very very low temperature, and uh, measure the density of water. Density is weight divided by volume. So higher density means uh, smaller volume. Okay, and uh, we measure the density as temperature change. I'm sorry, the x axis in absolute tem temperature, so you have to subtract 273 to get Celsius. And you have um, maximum density at 4 degrees, as 
everybody learn in school. But then it goes down very quickly at the low temperature and reaching a minus 50 degrees Celsius, you get a minimal density. That's very peculiar because most other liquids will behave uh, its behavior like this, just monotonic like this. And water turn around and go back. So if you look at this behavior, you almost think that there are two kinds of water. That is high density water here and very low density water here. It seems that water is more complex than you think. It consists of two kinds of water, high density water and low density water. Actually, just last year, a uh, group uh, found that uh, indeed there are two kinds of water, two kinds of water at very low temperature. Uh, this, uh, this remarkable property is that we find the water can exist at two different liquids, low temperature. Okay, and th this is uh, a discovery, uh, very important. And uh, we, in normal temperature, like room temperature, well, of course, have only one uh, liquid water. But the fact you can have two different kinds of water at very low temperature means, implies, at room temperature, it's structure, it's complex, it's kind of mixture of these two, and more complex than you think. It, now I come to the molecule model of water. The water you see is microscopic. But the microscopic consists of many, many H2O molecules. The H2 molecule I've drawn here like a, like a band, band with a stick, okay? This is hydrogen, hydrogen, and this is oxygen. Oxygen is negative charge. The hydrogen, the hydrogen is positive charge. So they attract each other to form a bond we call hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond. This is hydrogen bond between two oxygens. That's why they want to stick together to form a complete structure. And for a central water molecule, H2O, here you have uh, four hydrogen bonds to neighboring molecules, four. Indeed, that's the structure in ice, in ice. And uh, this, notice that this interaction picture is completely classical. You don't need quantum mechanics to do the rest. So I would say that the quantum mechanics somehow is not needed. Of course, the water molecule itself, the shape is consequence of quantum mechanics. But otherwise, when you look at water-water interaction, classical mechanics is enough. This is a picture of reductionism. We start to look at reductionism. From there on to go Microsoft scale, no quantum mechanics. I'm sorry to tell the physicists. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's minor. That's minor. I can't say the minor. Yes. But when you look at the code, uh, water cluster <laughs> then, then. Uh, <laughs> H2O itself is a consequence of quantum mechanics, but how they group together can really be mo simulated computer by classical mechanics only. And this is how class classical mechanical uh, simulation of water uh, liquid look like. It looked uh, chaotic, it looked random, but actually when you look closer, closer on the left-hand side, uh, as closer, uh, it, it has a structure, like, just like an ice, but it is more distorted, it's, and it's moving, and they are not in permanent shape. Okay, so I was... This is the answer. Chuck 
Dene çudüce. Çadı taşı ettim. Mare. Mare. Dütür. Hı. Di çak dü de çudü. Kırış da koyna. Çudüyle çak dü tağa şevri oda. Mare. Ka. Karşısa? Ale. Sisolinus is referring to classical Buddhist Abhidharma description of the how from the smallest kind of atomic level aggregation of molecules occur. Yes, in the, that's in the, what I, in, the, in the Buddhist context. Yes, so there that's are what I'm discussing the, here. Different names of different types of molecules are one one Buddhist school of thought. Yeah, this is in Abhidhamma. Now one Buddhist school oh. of Actually, thought. Actually, that's the correct uh, modern uh, view of uh, liquid, and uh, just a collection of molecules interact. Uh, they 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 interact yeah. over so and around. And mm. on the right hand, this picture. If you it just continue. Expand, connect together to one centimeter size. That's uh, what I'm describing. Okay. Now, uh, my question. I have a question. How big a water drop do need to be to have a water property? Because uh, individual water molecule is not a liquid water. Two is not. Two molecules stick together. Three, you don't have uh, this. Uh, Water product, but the, when it gets bigger and bigger, <coughs> you see water product. And then the question is, how big should it be? So I introduce scale here. Here, here. from uh, 0 0.1 nanometer, that's one answer on in the left hand side, all the way to 10 centimeter. Okay, and this scale goes from atom, molecule, DNA. Virus, bacteria, hair, uh, ant to tennis ball. In this scale, that's the nano world, between one nanometer and uh, 100 nanometer, that's the region I focus in. I look into that region. If the water is the size of that size, the method is we put water in very narrow slit, which size is in nanometer size and do the measurement of its melting point. And we find the melting point change as uh, the size uh, decreasing. When the size decrease, the decrease, it goes to the right, to the right of this graph. The melting point gets lower and lower. And here, at this point, that's 1.6 nanometer. 1.6 nanometer is very small. Well, you no longer have freezing behavior at all. At all, just liquid water, just liquid. So I would say, about that average, water is no longer normal liquid, not like. It. So, give you a brief answer. That is, at one point six or two nanometer, you lost the microscopic behavior of water. Is you should call something else called water cluster. <laughs> okay. The next subject I want to bring up is that uh, water is very accommodating. It's the most accommodating uh, liquid. It's a we chemical term we call solvent. It dissolves many things. It brings things together. Just like your holiness, you bring everybody together. <laughs> <laughs> bring everybody together. <laughs> 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 so it dissolves sugar. It, it can dissolve when you make tea, you can put sugar. It dissolves water. It brings water in. It brings iron. It brings salt. It brings acid into water. It brings base into water. 
it, it can dissolve amino acid, it can dissolve protein, it can dissolve carbohydrates, it can dissolve brain DNA, brain lipid, all are necessary for life. So that's the basic solvent for all the uh, material you need in your body, you need life. It brings everything together. But when you bring everything together, somehow it, a strange thing happened. Out of formless, when, when you just a cup of water dissolve everything, it's still no form, no shape, no, no structure. But out of formless, it began to form form. That's the life. Life is between form and the formless. Okay, that's the thing I want now to discuss about. How can form occur when you bring all this, everything together? They start to self-organize into structure, into life. I want to start with the, this point, that looking oil and water, here is a cup, has both water and oil. Of course, you know that oil and water does not mix together. They don't mix together. They just separate into oil and water. Yeah. In that sense, oil is water hating. It hates water. <laughs> we call hydrophobic. <laughs> and sugar can like water. Sugar always like going to water. Water love it. It's uh, hydrophilic. Uh, so is salt. So salt like water also. So there are two kinds of molecules. One is hydrophobic, hate water, represented by oil. The other is uh, hydrophilic. When they meet each other in a single molecule, in some of that's lipid molecule, lipid molecule. Lipid molecule represented by this model, this stick is hydrophobic, that's oil part. Lipid has a lot of oil molecule on, on it. It's hate water. And its head is hydrophilic. Its chemical term called phosphate is ion. As I say, ion like going to water. So they have a dilemma. Dilemma now. Whether they want to go into water or not. Part of my body hates water. But on the other hand, this uh, spherical head like water. So they form self organized into this structure we call my cell. My cell. So what is my cell? My cell is a collection of uh, this uh, molecule. Collection, they, they mm -hmm. just collect each other mm -hmm. and uh, assemble. They, they self-assemble. You don't need a worker to help it. They because in that way, this uh, water-hating part, that hydrophobic part, hating part, they can avoid water. They, they just want to avoid water. And of course, they can also so self organize into what uh, we call bilayer membrane. That's membrane structure. Again, the water hating part is inside. And the water loving part is outside and facing water. Water is around on the outside. This kind of structure can form infinite in many different forms as in the biological cell. Biological cell, first you look at it, it has a cell membrane. This is on the left hand side, this is a cell membrane. That's formed by this uh, lipids. It has hydrophobic and hydrophilic part, and they, they self-organize. So forms start to, to occur uh, instead of a structureless uh, dissolution. And uh, in a full cell, biological cell, you have many, many membranes, like uh, here, uh, there's a lot of membrane structure, like uh, here it's called mitochondria, and uh, there's a nucleus, nu nucleus of the cell. Again. Uh, on the surface of nuclear is the nuclear membrane. So, water drives the membrane formation. 
So the conclusion is that water not bring everybody together, but also it helps to organize, to organize into Okay, that's one aspect of the water role. It's self-organized, it's form, into form uh, of all the fundamental structure in the cell. The second role is that in the biological cell, you need energy. You need energy. The energy we call chemical energy. Chemical energy. The, the fundamental chemical energy, of course, comes from sunlight. And this reaction tells you uh, photosynthesis coming from sunlight in the plant. You have a sunlight and you have chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is the catalyst that uh, making this molecule. And you have CO2, carbon dioxide, and then water. Water then, after this photosynthetic reaction occurs, you store your sunlight energy into chemical energy in the form of sugar, or we call carbon hydrate. Its formula is C6H12O6. But on the other hand, you can look at it as six carbon plus six water. So water stores chemical energy in sugar. So water has two roles. One, water is opposite to fat. So they separate into intricate biological structure. They drive this drug, as I just talked about. Then second, water is the medium of energy storage when light is con converted into chemical energy in biological system. That's what I mean when I say water is all encompassing. It brings everything together, help it organize, help it give energy, stored energy. That's the great organization media for other water's role. You organize the biological uh, form. Now, to come to philosophy, <laughs> the, this old <laughs> saying by Lao Tzu, again, we're talking about Lao Tzu. This sentence is very simple. It says, the highest virtue is like water. Of course, you can interpret it in many, many different ways. But I would like to cite the Kung Fu master, Bruce Lee. <laughs> it, it's a good interpretation of Lao Tzu's sentence, say the highest virtue is like water. I read this sentence, say, you must be shapeless, formless, like water. When you pour water in the cup, it becomes a cup. When you pour water in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. When you pour water into a teapot, it becomes a teapot. Water can drip and it can penetrate because become like water, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's <laughs> the essence of Chinese martial art. In the martial art, you don't attack directly, you don't hit, you yield. It flows, it flows and it yields. And that's what the road waters do. It's, I just uh, explained to you. It penetrates everything, bring everything together, and it flow and it organize. It organize thing uh, to have good chemical storage of energy, and it functions as a biological uh, tissue. Next, I will also show this uh, Chinese painting. This Panther is famous, Zhang Da Qian. Uh, I would not uh, uh, describe the, uh, what it does, but don't you feel 
a strong feeling of water in here. Not just the river, but also the cloud, the median, the forest, everything is permeated by water. And that, in that sense, water permeates everything. It describes a sense of that. Finally, I would come to the problem of oil. We scientists, as we discussed yesterday, as uh, His Holiness uh, instructs us, we scientists should also think about the uh, problem people face, to solve people's suffering. Many places in the world suffer from lack of drink water. Uh, in places like uh, Africa, people have traveled great distance to bring water, and water is dirty. dirty. In India, it's uh, extremely high water stress, and the degree of strain is uh, colored by here. Uh, along uh, the region of uh, New Delhi, Delhi, uh, uh, and upper part, upper left part, is it, great stress. Uh, Groundwater or exhaust. I think the, in this place, the uh, water is less from because uh, in mountain. But overall, India has water uh, resource stress. People lack water, drinkable water, clean water. How we can do about it? This phenomenon, of course, uh, has to do with uh, global warming. Uh, which Professor YTD will talk about tomorrow. I don't have the time to explain it, but because the impact of global warming, uh, the groundwater of uh, uh, India, Indo Ganges plant, is it become more exhausted. What the, uh, scientists can think about is how to solve the water problem by understanding water to bring. Uh, more water uh, from places you never use. For example, in arid area in desert, can you bring water just from air? In air, there's lots of water vapor. Although it does not rain, but water is there. Uh, we are studying those things, uh, try to bring uh, 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 water from vapor into liquid water so that it can be used. Of course, that's a way of also doing air conditioning also, which is uh, our subject study. Uh, finally, I will just leave a few questions here uh, for discussion. I stop here. Thank you very much. Your holiness. Your thoughts. Second point, second question. Is it possible to have life without water? So, uh, in relation to the second question, from a scientific point of view, um, would you say things like rocks are alive? Um, it's all life. They, they are alive yeah. inside rock, but it's uh, in, in, in space that where it has water. Uh, they, they, they are... Yeah. Gapes, gapes inside yeah. uh, uh, rock, Ta and there was water. water. So on Earth, at least on Earth, life is impossible with, without water. You That's need to have water. Okay. You always need water. But in galaxy, uh, uh, I don't know, nobody knows. But presumably, I, I would believe that in the universe, also life depends on water. Uh, Jumma That is, that is. So, um, in 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 a classical Indian tradition, there is the idea of worlds coming into being from emptiness, 
you know, empty space. Talk about five element. Yeah, everything dissolving. Come from five element. Then finally, also the way dissol dissolution. Dissolution also is also dissolving through the five elements. Mm. So when the world is being universe is being formed, it starts from the subtler, which is space, then uh, uh, air, and then. That I usually uh, see describing. Uh, Particle space. Space, yeah. Space, space particle. That's the basis, no beginning. So the previous galaxies disappear and remain <coughs> empty. That means uh, space particle. Space particle also is momentarily changing. Otherwise, it's impossible to develop any. The other, other evolution. So, so from the space, you have the wind, and then uh, fire, mm -hmm. and then water. The fire said it's yeah. the heat, heat. It's heat, yeah. Heat. And oh. then water, and then earth. Uh -huh. But when water it, said it was liquid. So mm -hmm. it's it's more to do with you know liquidity and coherence, um, the the one that keeps the cohesion, and then the earth. But when it dissolves, so it dissolves. From from the grosser, which is the earth, to water. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a recognition in this way of the, you know um, imagining the world, where there is a recognition that water is you know subtler than earth element, mm -hmm. but then it's grosser than the other ones. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the way this uh, earth, our our own earth, started. Hmm? Did it? Our, our own yeah. Earth. The whole uh, galaxy is the, the planet, planet yeah. Earth. Limitless started. galaxies. Yeah. Yeah. In galaxies, many, Mainly many places could happen you see, come, this way. Disappear according to the five process. elements. Yes. Yes. Five elements. Yes. This process. Yes. In the beginning of uh, this planet, probably uh, out of space, bring everything together, together with, with water and the Earth, and then and uh, energy, energy heat, yeah. heat to form this uh, uh, planet. I'm almost sure that we believe same thing happened in other, other planets, many other planets. Because I think Big Bang Theory, uh, I think because of the concert Big Bang, uh, so, of course, from the cos modern cosmology point of view, you invoke the notion of a starting point, which is Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And then from the Buddhist point of view, from that empty kind of mm. space uh, state, then the evolution of the elements. Right, yes. Yeah. Big bang, big bang. yeah. And Big Bang oh. concept could be accommodated and in, incorporated into, oh. into that, that process. Uh, so then you you know have this idea of a Big Bang and from which mm -hmm. the space and then the uh, other elements emove, em, you know, emerge. Did you do it? Big Bang is a so from that point of view, if the question is asked, where does the Big Bang come from? So at least for the Buddhists, there is something to say. <laughs> what the Buddhism say about Big Bang? <laughs> <laughs> Space particle, you Because there's, there's never a period when there is no vacuum, there is no space particles. So a new universe forms out of that space particles. Mm -hmm. Space particle also, you see, the nature of changing momentarily changing. So the different space particle combine. Then uh, energy come. come down. Energy develop heat. Heat develop liquid. Liquid develop solid. So there's quite a logical sort of explanation. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Chagwek
Newe Kewa, Tene Jikwe Kewa, Tene Tongwe Kewa. So then the whole process goes through cycle. Dear, Zemni Chowa Taikya. And they are the Tonga Chikyo Kasa. Ka. Oh, Roger Jazu. Do you say the shame that you don't with you? So there's in the Buddhist text there is actually quite a um, um, large scale systems brought in in terms of the evolution of the cosmos, and uh, not only through the four the five elements, but there is also a recognition of stages in the so for example there is the period of emptiness, then there is a period of formation, then there is a period of you know endurance or so it's the period of emptiness is the period when the previous universe has come to an end. Then there is a period of formation, period of you know endurance, and then there is a period of dis- dis- a stage of destruction, which then moves back to the stage of emptiness, and then the whole cycle begins. And not only is it explained in terms of our world system, but in these texts there is also a conception of you know limitless universe systems, all of which go through similar cycles of stages. Kevin,明治,春季,んかね、たまにログジグにさばれ。ああ、メイドの注意、実家さちせんで。た、明治で、ページ、ゆんぐ、じゃ、なんかその、ジャイブすると。だ、2名、2名、2人、2人、2人、
So then I thought maybe between there, <laughs> <laughs> one say to the five, one say twelve. Twelve, <laughs> so must be between there. Somewhere between. <laughs> so, <laughs> so around <laughs> twenty. <laughs> so according to you, how many billions of years? Big Bang, the dating of the Big Bang. Yeah. Uh, 13. 13 billion years. 13. 13. 13. 13 billion. Oh, that's, I think, good. 13. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, that was a very uh, nice session, and thank you, uh, Your Holiness, and thank uh, the speakers, uh, oh, Professor Mo, and I guess myself. <laughs> and also, thank the audience. Uh, please, uh, 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 if you're interested, we will have a, an, another open discussion this afternoon.